Okay, in this video I'd like to continue on with my tutorials discussing complex analysis. This is video number two and I'm going to derive Green's theorem. Green's theorem is one of the fundamental theorems in complex analysis. And just to give you a small bit of motivation as to why it's used, if you're discussing electromagnetism, you require a lot of vector calculus and a lot of the results of the vector calculus come from Green's theorem. So really, if you can't understand Green's theorem or haven't uh, a strong knowledge of Green's theorem, you can't really and truly get stuck into vector calculus, which means you can't really and truly get stuck into electromagnetism. So that's just a basic, uh, hopefully a basic piece of motivation for this. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all of my videos archived and listed, and I've also a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. Before you begin, I need to bring to your attention some previous videos. I discussed, I had four videos discussing complex numbers, or where I did each of the bits and pieces in depth. Thereafter, I had a single video where I discussed complex numbers in 10 minutes. And then I did the first video in the series on complex analysis where I derived the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, or the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So let's see if we can derive Green's theorem. I think it's useful to tell you in advance what it is, or give you the bottom line up front. The bottom line up front is that Green's theorem shows that a closed surface integral is equivalent to a double integral along a surface. Closed line integral is equivalent to a, a double surface integral. Now, of course, there are some caveats here and there's a bit of qualification to be done, but basically you go from a closed line integral to an open surface integral. Let's consider an arbitrary two-dimensional curve, and I'm gonna call this particular curve C. And this is gonna be closed and it's going to be inside an arbitrary vector field. I'm going to just call, just call the vector field P, and it's going to be a function of both X and Y. Uh, well, it could be a function of both X and Y, but at the moment what we're going to do is just consider the X component, or the I hat component, of the vector field P. So we have a two-dimensional curve C inside uh, an arbitrary vector field which only has an I hat component. And I've sketched this here on the plane at the bottom left of your screen. So we have our x-axis and we have our y-axis. And then we have the curve itself. The curve itself is this particular shape here. Notice it's going anti-clockwise. And I've split it into two points as we'll see in a moment. So the, the joining points are here now in red. And we have two curves which join, namely y1 of x on the bottom and y2 of x on the top. Once again, it's an anti-clockwise curve, where we say c, the curve, is a function of z, which is a function of both x and y. So like I said, we consider breaking the curve c, or the closed curve c, into two different paths, y1 of x and y2 of x, whose sum is going to be equal to c. We look at the vector field p, P can be a function of both X and Y, and although we'll consider it being a function of Y in a moment, let's just consider it having an I hat, or X component. So the J hat component goes to zero, we're left with P sub X in the I hat direction, and I'm just gonna call it L. So L can be both a function of X and Y, but it points only in the I hat direction. Later on, we'll discuss where we have M, which is both a function of X and Y, but points only in the j-hat direction. It is still useful to note, and it's important to note, that although L is in the i-hat direction, it still is a function of both x and y. So it's not just L sub x, it has a component in the y direction also. However, their sum, or the sum, the whole function put together, only points in the i-hat direction. Now, we're going to consider the closed line integral around the curve C, but inside the vector field P, which only has an i-hat direction. Now, of course, the, 
the line is going to be dr, the infinitesimal line element is dr. So del x i hat plus or dx i hat plus dy j hat plus dz k hat. So we're going to discuss the closed line integral here. Okay, note by the way there's a small arrow on the actual uh, on, on the closed part of the integral which indicates its direction. In this case we are going anti-clockwise. So we're going to take p dot dr. But of course it is, p only has an i hat direction, dr has an i j k hat direction, so the dot product will only be in the i hat direction. So we get nothing, uh, no component from dy j hat or dz k hat. Our closed line integral going anti-clockwise simply becomes L dx. But of course, L is a function of two variables, namely x and y. And as a moment ago we said, we've broken the y component into two separate curves, y1 of x and y2 of x. So what we do is we actually rewrite this closed line integral as the sum of two integrals whose sum of course is a closed line. And we have x, we'll say L a function of x and y1 of x, and L a function of x and y2 of x. I hope that's pretty straightforward. It is extremely important to note the limits. Note that on the lower cur curve where we have L a function of x and y1, we start at a and we go to b. So we're on the lower curve down here, we start at a and we go to b. We'll see in a moment that on the top curve we will start at b and go to a. So on the top curve we start at b and go to a, and on the lower curve we start at a and we go to b. Now it's always useful to have integrals with the same limits because you can bring them together. So we note that we have a to b here, but we have b to a here. So if we negate the second integral, we can actually swap the limits. So we do something like this. And that's what I've done down here. So now we have two integrals, both of a function of x, and they both have the same starting and end points. So what I've done here on the top of your screen is I've rewritten both of those integrals together. They have the common integral sign and the common variable dx and I've written them here as their difference. L a function of x and y1 minus L a function of x and y2. Now I will do something which should become clear in a moment, or the reason for which should become clear in a moment. I'm going to swap the order. So instead of having L a function of x and y1 minus L a function of x and y2, I'm going to swap them. And in, so, I'm, in doing so, I'm going to negate the integral. So we're going to have minus the integral from a to b of L a function of x and y2 minus L a function of x and y1. Why would we bother doing this? Well, as you'll see in a moment, because we're going to invoke the result of the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you would like to know more about the fundamental theorem of calculus, see my video number 29 in the section Vector Calculus for Electromagnetism. So I'm not really going to go through the theorem now, but if you look at it, look at what we have up here, for long enough you'll realize that in actual fact we have the fundamental theorem and we can invoke it. More specifically, what we can say is we can, if we ignore all of this here, we have the result of the fundamental theorem, namely the difference between L of x and y2 and L of x and y1. This of course can be rewritten in another, another way using another piece of nomenclature where we say we have the single function L, a function of x and y, evaluated at the endpoints y1 and y2. The next thing we're going to do is consider another integral. Let's consider 
where of course the integral or the the derivative of the um, the derivative actually exists also. But let's say we were able to differentiate our function l with respect to y, and of course integrate that with respect to y between the limits of y1 of x and y2 of x, what would happen? Well, this is a pretty trivial integral to evaluate, and of course what we get is L a function of x and y evaluated at the endpoints. In fact, it's the exact same as what we found a moment ago. So what we really see is that this expression up here is the integral with respect to x of this particular expression here. Putting it all together, the closed line integral in an anti-clockwise direction of the vector field P, which only has an i-hat component, with uh, dot dr is equal to minus the integral with respect to x going from a to b of L, a function of x and y1, excuse me, y2, minus L, a function of x and y, y1, is equal to minus the same integral, but where, where we can rewrite it as the integral from y1 of x to y2 of x of del L del y dy. And you might be saying to yourself, why are we bothered doing, bother doing this? It looks like, it looks like a, re a real sleight of hand. The use of this will be very clear in a moment. So let's just write the whole thing again. So I've rewritten it down here. And I've put, in, uh, excuse me, I've put, in, I've put both of my integrals together. So we have our minus sign and we have both integrals, one res with respect to x and the other with respect to y. So really what we have is the double integral with respect to x and y of the function del L del y in, uh, evaluated at different points. More compactly, we can rewrite this instead of using the double integral. I prefer just to have a single integral uh, sign, but use this s to imply that we're talking about a surface integral or a double integral. And instead of saying dA, well, we say that dA is equal to dx dy. This, of course, is a surface integral. So this closed line integral here is rewritten as a surface integral. It is equivalent to a surface integral. Now, the geometry of this will become uh, will become evident later, and it's not something I'm going to discuss at this particular point. So, to remind ourselves, we had a two-dimensional vector field, which only had an i-hat component. We took a anti-clockwise closed path. We split it into two uh, two particular paths, y1 and y2 of x. When we looked at the closed line integral, we saw that it is equivalent to a surface integral of the function del L del Y. How is it that we can interpret this geometrically? Well, let's say we had Y, which is a function of F of X. Well, we need X to get Y, so we're talking about a two dimensional function. Well, z is a function of x and y, so this is a three-dimensional function. This means that the surface, or the double integral, will calculate the value for z at every point x, y in the surface s. But the surface s is nothing more than the area of the line integral which we started with. Let's say that again. The surface integral will calculate the value for z at every point x, y in the x, y plane, which is inside the surface s. But the surface s is nothing more than the area of our line integral. So therefore, including z, we are getting a three-dimensional volume. The height of this three-dimensional volume has the functional form del L del y, or if we, could re if we want, we could rewrite it as del p of x, y, del y. So we're actually talking about a three-dimensional function here. We have the, the surface which lives in the x, y plane, function of x and y, but there's a certain amount of height associated with this, which and the value of that is del l, del y. 
Up until now, we just considered a vector field P a function of x, y, which manifested as only having an i hat component. Now what we will do is we will consider a separate vector field Q a function of x, y. But this is only going to have a j hat component. And we're going to consider its action along the same line integral C. And having looked at what happened with the vector field P, we'll see if we can infer the results for the vector field Q. Once again, we are going to break up the vector field C into two different paths, namely x1 of y and x2 of y. Now the point here is that the vector field Q has no i hat component, so this section Q sub x will go to zero, but Q sub y is non-zero. So Q really just is Q sub y in the j hat direction. And just for convenience, I'm going to rewrite this as capital M j hat. So Q manifests as Q sub y j hat, and I'm just going to call it M j hat. That's that's kind of the uh, the general thing which people do when discussing Green's theorem. Dr doesn't change, and it's still dx i hat plus dy j hat plus dz k hat. And once again, we're going to consider the closed line integral around C inside the vector field Q. Q has no i hat component. Therefore, the only procedural difference between this particular integral and the previous closed line integral which we performed is with the limits. C is, is anti-clockwise, and this means that the positive direction is considered to be anti-clockwise. So what we did when we discussed the closed line integral of p dot dr, we went from x min is equal to a to x max is equal to b, and then from x max is equal to b to x min is equal to a. And we saw that we, in order to have the limits the same, we negated one of these and put b up top and a down below, and we were able to amalgamate the integrals. The y limits will be similar but different. We will go from y min, which is equal to e, to y max is equal to f on the first part of the curve, and then from y max is equal to f to y min is equal to e. Once again, then we will swap the limits on one and negate it and add the components into a single integral. Let's look at this graphically. So we have the same curve on the same plane. We note that we have x min is equal to a down here and x max is equal to b. So in the previous integral we went from here to here and back around. Now what we are going to do is go from here to here and back around. So, looking at our closed line integral, going anti-clockwise, q dot dr is going to have only a j hat component. Well, it's actually going to be dimensionless, or it, sorry, it's going to have no direction, but the j hat components will be the only ones that count. So we have m dy. So we have two sections of integral, going from e to f, and then from f to e. Now note, by the way, from e to f, we're integrating x1 of y and y, but from f to e, we're integrating x2 of y and y. And this is important. It is opposite to what we had seen in the past. When we discussed p dot dr, the first component we had x, we had y1, and we had y2. Now I know you might say this is a matter of the order, but you'll see why it's important to note which is which. So, the first part of the integral we're going to keep the same, and we're just going to bring, bring it down here and rewrite it. So of course it's going to be a positive integral. But we're going to swap the limits on the second integral, therefore negating it. And we're going to invoke the fundamental theorem of calculus, just like we did in the past. However, this time we're going to have x1 of y on top and x2 of y on the bottom. Whereas when we discussed p, we actually had y2 of x on top and y1 of x on the bottom. So just be careful with this because it could cause confusion. 
We of course can rewrite this using nomenclature. I keep I keep trying to say that word and I'm struggling. Uh, we use the nomenclature and we rewrite it using a single integral operator, but we imply that it's a surface integral using the letter s, and we have dA implying del uh, dx dy as well. So we see that the closed line integral of q dot dr going anti-clockwise is equivalent to the surface integral of del m del x, which is of course equivalent to q sub y del x. So looking at what we had already in terms of p, we see that we have two line integrals, one for a vector field which uh, points in the i-hat direction and the other for a vector field which points in the j-direction. Now just note by the way that this one here is positive for this one here is negative and that's that's not an error, that's in fact the way it should be. We know of course that del m del x and del l del y are going to be heights and that's something I'm going to discuss now in a moment. So what does this particular surface or double integral actually represent? Well, let's discuss this again. What we'll do is we'll start on the left side of your screen here, and we'll start with the uh, with just with the xy plane. So let's try and visualize the xy plane here. I know it's going to get quite crowded, but here's our xy plane. So let's take each of our functions. Let's say we took either del m del x or del L del Y. It doesn't really matter, just pick one of them because both will do the same sort of thing or the geometry will be the same. So both of these, they're a function of some, fort, so, of some sort. So let's just, let's draw an arbitrary function here, just like I've done. Now, but this is going to be above the XY plane because it's a function of both X and Y which puts it in the Z dimension. What this means though, is that the projection of the surface del m del x or del l del y onto the xy plane will or the yeah the surface up here whatever it is is going to give you the surface enclosed by the line c so we had x and y which gives you a height above the xy plane the projection of this particular function onto the xy plane is going to be the surface s and the surface S is the same for both of the integrals which we've seen above. The point is that the curve is the two-dimensional projection of the 3D shapes del L del Y and del M del X onto the XY plane. Let's just remind ourselves what they look like. We have del M del X here, del L del Y or minus del L del Y. We have the closed line integral equivalent to the surface integral. Now let's see if we can put the whole thing together. Let's begin by defining a new vector field, capital R. Let's say the capital R is the sum of P and Q. Of course we can do this because P is simply in the I hat and Q is in the J hat. Or we know that we can rewrite as an L and M. Now the reason I'm doing this is because some people use L and M, some people use P and Q. So I'm trying to cover all of the bases. Now let's see what would happen if we took the closed line integral of the vector field capital R dot dr. Well, capital R now has both an i hat component and a j hat component. So when you dot it with small r, you'll still have two components, one in the x and one in the y, just like we have here. So you have the closed line integral of L dx and M dy. But we know what these are already. We can substitute the two expressions we had above in. Now I'm trying to bring your attention to the fact that one of these is minus and one of these is plus. But of course these are over the same surface. Same surface and same curve. Both are surface integrals dA so we can rewrite these as a single integral. And we see that if we take the closed line integral of an arbitrary vector field in two dimensions, x and y, dot dr, it's equivalent to the surface integral of del q del x minus del p del y. Or del, del l del x, excuse me, del l del y and del m del x. And you might be saying, how come I'm using all of these variables? 
it's for no particular reason other than other people when discussing Green's theorem will use L and M or P and Q. So I'd just like to show you where they go. This is Green's theorem. Green's theorem says again that if you take the closed line integral of a two-dimensional vector field in X and Y, it's equivalent to a single surface, or excuse me, a double integral or a surface integral of del Q del X minus del P del Y or del M del X minus del L del Y. It's the three-dimensional version of what's called the divergence theorem. It's kind of like that and later on I will show the relationship between Green's theorem and the divergence theorem. It is very important to note that the Green's theorem or Green's theorem only applies to closed curves. We have derived it only for closed curves and it is only valid for those. So if you ever come across an open curve and you're looking to apply Green's theorem, you should stop yourself there and then and correct yourself. So that's all I've got to say about this for the moment. In the next video I shall derive, Green, derive Green's theorem using a slightly different method and use Stokes' theorem. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel and you might also give a, a visit to universityphysicstutorials.com. Thank you.